Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My guest in part one of our special two-part series is Nadine Strawson, law professor at the New York School in Tribeca. Nadine, thanks for joining me. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Aaron. Well, it's great. I want to mention your book, Hate Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech. I want to talk a lot about that as well. But I also want to tell you, since you were the, you were the president of the ACLU, from 1991 to 2008. A long stretch of time, 17 yes. 17 years, so what were you, like 12 when you started the- <laughs> Thank uh... you so much. It was a wonderful experience, and I'm still very, very involved with the ACLU on its National Advisory Council, so I still say we when I talk about the, the ACLU. ACLU. And now, was, is it Ira, was it Ira Glasser? Ira Glasser was uh, the executive director, so the president, as many members don't realize, is an unpaid volunteer position. The whole time I was national president, which was almost 18 years, I was also earning my living because I'm not independently wealthy, working as a law professor. Uh, the CEO of the organization, the president is sort of like the chair of the board. Right. The CEO, the executive director, is a full-time paid position. Uh, during my presidency, the first CEO was Ira Glasser, and then I was uh, uh, presided over the selection of his successor, Anthony Romero. So uh, I should tell you that many years ago, not far into your term, uh, I was sued for $20 million by Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> for and, alleged defamation? Uh, well, I, I, I was asked to do a national radio talk show, which I did, on Talk America Radio Network. Oh, I did a show there, too. And we, we were, uh, the show was called After the Rush, and he oh. did not like oh. that. So we had a big battle in federal court uh, in Denver. Uh, and it took us a year and a half to uh, get him to dismiss his case, but the, ACL, the ACLU played a very prominent role uh, helping me and, and my uh, in-house counsel uh, defeat Mr. Limbaugh. So. Oh, congratulations. I'm so happy to hear that. And I will tell you, uh, I used to do, there used to be this show called Hannity and Combs sure. right before it was just sure. Hannity. I, was I knew actually, Alan. Yes, and he was a card-carrying ACLU member, sadly died quite young. But um, Sean Hannity was fond of telling me that when he was a college journalist, he had to invoke the ACLU's support uh, for a violation of his free speech rights. So we neutrally defend all fundamental freedoms, including free speech, for all people, including those who disagree with us profoundly on some civil liberties issues. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was wonderful assistance. So I, I want to talk about hate speech and, and uh, a little bit about your book. Uh, actually, a lot about your book. So wh you. what is hate speech? Well, hate speech, and I'm going to use air quotes just for once, and from now on your audience can imagine them, uh, it is not a constitutional law term of art precisely because the U.S. Supreme Court has never defined a category of speech labeled hate speech, which is unprotected based on its hateful or hated message. To the contrary, the Supreme Court has pretty much adopted uh, the statement attributed to Voltaire, I may detest or hate what you say, but I defend to the death your right to say it. In everyday speech, we tend to use the term hate speech in two ways. Uh, very very often it is used for any expression of any idea that the person using the term hates. And so we have had it, we've seen that term used uh, against Black Lives Matter activists. We've seen it used against Blue Lives Matter activists. We have actually even seen the term hate speech used against the concept of free speech. Uh, and that's really the danger of censorship, Aaron, that it is such an inherently subjective term and concept that if we empower the government or university officials to pick and choose what they think is the hate speech that should be suppressed, then especially endangered are any unpopular or dissenting views. Now, the way I use the term throughout my book is mostly the way it is generally understood, and that is to refer to speech that conveys a hateful or discriminatory view, particularly on the basis of race, gender, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, traditional bases for discrimination and marginalization of particular groups of people. So what, what do you think Americans don't under, understand about the concept of free speech? Uh, but before that, what, what is the, the Supreme Court's record 
on hate speech because in your book you address uh, a, and, and, you, and you go into a number of cases and uh, some great quotes from justices. So talk about the Supreme Court historically in yeah, particular. Yeah, and this is a, a wonderful opportunity to say that despite all of the debate in the public sphere and the political sphere, many politicians saying hate speech is not free speech, the Supreme Court has been remarkably unanimous for a remarkably long time on this issue. The most recent Supreme Court decision on point, following in a long string of such decisions, was just in 2017 when this court, which is split so dramatically on so many constitutional issues, including First Amendment issues, nine to zero, I'm so sorry, it was eight to zero, because I think we still had a vacancy, um, uh, upheld the free speech right of a young Asian American rock musician named Simon Tam to use an ethnic slur, what traditionally had been an ethnic slur, as the name of his band, namely the Slants. And it turned out there was an anti-hate speech provision buried in a federal statute that said the government will not give trademark protection to any term that we consider to be disparaging or demeaning on the basis of ethnicity. Now this shows how inherently subjective the concept is because Simon Tam, as an Asian American, and the other members of his rock band were also Asian Americans. Obviously, they were not choosing that term in order to disparage or demean their own ethnic heritage. To the contrary, they were reclaiming the term, asserting their pride in their heritage, and uh, using it in an empowering way to reaffirm their dignity. So that's a really good example of why we should not entrust the government to make these nuanced decisions. It's up to each of us to decide what language we're going to use, what we're not going to use, what we will listen to, what we will ignore, what we will refute and debate against. All right. What, if you pointed to any decisions, I mean, some of the decisions you quoted were very elegantly mm -hmm. Rent, both elegantly and eloquently they, yes, uh, written. Yes. Tell, tell, give me an example of one oh, or two like, of Oh, like, you know, so, a couple of my favorites, which were originally written in dissent in the early part of the 20th century, by the mid-20th century were then affirmed as the court shifted gears and became very speech protective, and I'll say why in a moment. But the two great dissenters, uh, whose views are now representative of the majority, were Oliver Wendell Holmes, and Louis Brandeis. And Holmes, if I had to pick one statement, um, said that the most, the freedom that most imperatively calls for defense is freedom of speech, not for the thought that we love, but freedom for the thought that we hate. And Justice Brandeis uh, said, fear, uh, you know, a general fear that speech can do danger is not a sufficient justification for censoring it. Men feared witches and burned women. Uh, both of them also said something, uh, which I will repeat not in so eloquent terms, but uh, the answer to any speech you disagree with is not to silence it, but to answer it more speech, more education. You can use suppression only as a last resort when the speech really presents an emergency. It directly causes specific, imminent, serious harm, and there's not enough time to prevent the harm through law enforcement or through debate. And that's an extremely rare situation. All right, I want to talk about harm because I think that the perception of harm also has evolved. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with Nadine in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. 
I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harper Show and keep hope alive. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. We're with Nadine Strassen, who's written a book about hate speech and how to respond to it. Well, one of the things I did want to ask is, uh, in, in terms of, you know, we were talking about harm, but, but you t at the end of the last segment, you were talking about how it's important to respond to it. But not everybody has a platform to respond to it. So sometimes I think it's easy to say, oh, uh, here's someone who has uh, broadcast uh, hate speech or something that's hateful, uh, and millions of Americans have heard it, uh, you, know, you may want to respond, but that doesn't mean that millions of people are going to hear it. It may only be hundreds of people or thousands of people. So how do you level the playing field so that you can really respond in kind? This is actually one of the great benefits, or at least potential benefits, of the Internet and social media, where anybody who has access to it can reach a literally worldwide audience instantaneously. And to be sure, as with any medium of communication, it can be used for bad as well as for good. So we all know that it's much easier to disseminate hateful, discriminatory ideas over the internet. But guess what? What we call counter speech, responding to it, reaffirming the equality and dignity of the disparaged people, has also become much easier. And interestingly enough, Aaron, a number of the social media companies have financed studies of what types of online counter speech are most effective. And uh, it's really very exciting. Uh, for example, reaching out with compassion for the hater, not at all for the hateful idea, but not rejecting that person as a human being, not surprisingly, is a lot more effective in trying to move that person away from the hateful ideas than is labeling them a racist and calling them out and calling for them to be fired, uh, much less putting them in jail, as happens in other Western European countries and even Canada and Australia and others that enforce anti-hate speech laws. So I am actually much more encouraged about the potential power of counter speech. In fact, uh, at the Aspen Ideas Festival, one of the other speakers is one of the prominent individuals who is now, had been the leader of a very uh, horrible, discriminatory, violent, hate-mongering white supremacist group who was weaned away and formed an organization called Life After Hate, uh, which now has recruited at least a hundred people who were formerly leaders of these hate organizations, and now each one of them is in turn using the power of the internet and other communications to wean away others. So I have a great hope in persuading not only people who are kind of neutrally listening to debates, but even those who are preaching hatred. Yeah, but on the other hand, I guess I still maintain mm. my argument that if I have 10 million followers mm. and I tweet something that's very hateful, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not saying it should be suppressed, mm. and let's say you have 1,000 followers mm. and you respond, mm. you're not reaching the 10 million followers that, that I 
that but, I have. But ordinary people have this enormous potential, and we've seen it. I mean, look at the outpouring against Roseanne Barr. She surely has many more followers than any of the individuals, and yet, within less than a day, right, uh, she had lost her TV show. And we look at uh, pushback against Donald Trump after Charlottesville, when he made that pusillanimous statement trying to equate the haters on one side with the anti-haters on the other side. The pushback was immediate. And yeah, it but again, again, my point mm -hmm. is what you're mistaking is mm -hmm. that in those both those instances, mm -hmm. uh, the key people numerically mm -hmm. who pushed back mm -hmm. had millions of followers. And that and I'm saying that if you or I respond and we're someone who doesn't, we're not one of the celebrities who responded. But or I'm saying well ordinary people have had that impact right, too. Right, right. But I'm saying your your or my statement mm. as an ordinary person is not going to necessarily be read not by necessarily. Ten I mean, but right. I think there's more opportunity for it to catch on and then be sure, picked up sure. by celebrities and, and you, than you, existed right. before. Right. You, you certainly have the avail the ability and the opportunity to respond. My point is that if you look at the numbers the response of the common person mm -hmm. is not going to, unless someone picks it up, mm -hmm. who has right. a lot of right. friends, a lot of followers, whatever right. the case may be, it's not going to be seen. And, and, so, and, so my point is just mm -hmm. simply being able to respond is not sufficient. I would, I would argue that it's not a level playing field. And I think you're mistaken to think that it, that it, it, is, it is as easily. My question mm -hmm. then is, if you accept that premise, mm -hmm. that the numbers are not even mm -hmm. that 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 there isn't parity mm -hmm. that if if president trump mm -hmm. says something to his 25 or 50 million mm -hmm. followers and nadine strassen replies my guess is not even one percent mm -hmm. of those people are going to see your tweet or your post should organizations like twitter or facebook mm -hmm. or well actually yeah. combining a lot yeah. of organizations <laughs> these days yeah. should they play some type of role in providing uh, numerical access for responses. Should, should there be any kind of policy that Facebook, uh, it, whether if it determines something is inappropriate, doesn't mean it deletes it, right. same with Twitter, yeah. but that should it give uh, a Nadine access to those 25 million? I think that's a very interesting suggestion, and I want to clarify something that apparently I didn't make clear enough, which is I'm not saying that counter speech is a panacea and that it is going to be effective in any situation. I think it's more, we have more hope that it will be effective in the internet age. But I, I also say very strongly in the book exactly your point, Aaron, that we have a responsibility to make sure that the resources, including the education and the access to technology, are evenly distributed. And in fact, you know, to overcome the infamous digital divide that sadly has disadvantaged precisely uh, some of the vulnerable and marginalized minority groups that tend to be subject to hate speech. So uh, you and I really are on the same page on that. And the other point I would make is compared to what? Yes, counter speech is not perfect, far from it. But to me, it is far less imperfect than entrusting the government, the very same Donald Trump that you use in terms of his power as a tweeter. As commander in chief, he's even more powerful. Do I want him or his attorney general, Jeff Sessions, or in fairness, if it had been Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, I still would not want to entrust them with deciding what speech is hate speech and should be censored. I have the same kind of distrust about the powerful online companies. And it's not just me personally. Uh, let me cite, um, so there are many, many criticisms that have been made how these companies have been wielding their power to enforce their own anti-hate speech policies and other censorship policies, uh, including in particular from civil rights and civil liberties activists. A large coalition, 77 civil liberties and civil rights organizations since 2014 have been complaining to Facebook and Twitter that they are enforcing their policies against hate speech in a way that disproportionately silences minority critics of government policy, including Black Lives Matter protesters, 
pipeline protesters, and even when they uh, go to, when, when minority people who have been subject to hate speech, you know, go to Facebook to post it and to complain about it, and racism is still a problem, and please support me, and please raise your voices, that is treated as, as hate speech. So I think, you know, yes, we should continue to put pressure on these companies to uh, maximize the opportunity for counter speech, but we should be skeptical uh, and, and on the alert for abuses, potential abuses of their power as we are for potential abuses of government power. Well, I, I don't disagree with that on. In fact, uh, even my suggestion about, you know, can a Facebook, can a Twitter, can an Instagram, uh, can a Google somehow help level the playing mm -hmm. field just in terms of the, the uh, the distribution of messages, mm -hmm. so the propagation of messages. Mm -hmm. So to me, access isn't an issue. Everybody has access, but you have access to different numbers. You may have access to 10,000 people. Donald Trump has access to 50 million people. And then here, here's a further complication. So when the president, when the, the president tweets, mm -hmm. uh, many different things happen in terms of the propagation of that message. Mm -hmm. So we'll take a break, come back to that, and, and talk about how do you address that challenge. So we'll be right back in just a moment with Nadine. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. The Rex Al Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Join me and watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harper Show and keep hope alive. The Aaron Harper Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. Remember, this is part one of our two-part series with Professor Nadine Strassen of the New York Law School. So, Nadine, we were talking about numbers, and, yeah. and to me, one of the really interesting phenomena is when the, the president tweets, he has, say, 25 million followers, and I won't get into how many are real, fake, and other accounts and all that. Um, the estimates are that between one and five million people will actually see his tweet, mm -hmm. uh, and these are people uh, in terms of his followers. Mm -hmm. But then the media, mm -hmm. the press, mm -hmm. different outlets, they will broadcast yes. and replay the tweet, print the tweet, right. whatever the case may be. And those numbers soar, and they mm -hmm. can soar to as many as 100 or even, in some cases, 200 million people mm -hmm. seeing a tweet. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my point, that yeah. 
that Aaron's or Nadine's tweet mm -hmm. in response is not going to be carried by CBS News or mm -hmm. it's not going to be seen on Fox and Friends mm -hmm. or whatever the case, mm -hmm. that the media, and, and, and again, the president is artful, he sends out so many tweets mm -hmm. that they, all, they rarely include mm -hmm. any kind of coherent response mm -hmm. uh, and they're barely able to get all the tweets he does mm -hmm. on the air in a mm -hmm. given day mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's really almost consistently no coherent response mm -hmm. to what the president has to say. And, but isn't it interesting when we look at Charlottesville, which to me is at least one of the most egregious uh, failures on his part to condemn blatant racism, which among other things, as a Jew I took, ex whose father was a Holocaust survivor, he took very personally, uh, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us. I was really heartened by the pushback throughout society, not only social media, but you had uh, so many public officials, including many conservative Republicans, as well as liberal Democrats. You had military leaders coming out of the woodwork to condemn and separate themselves from his implicit sanctioning of that racism. You had business leaders, uh, uh, including those who had been participating in some councils that he had formed resign in protest. And so it happened not only at the top levels of leadership throughout our society, but also at the grassroots communities all over the country, including a little town in Connecticut where I was uh, spending that summer, spontaneously had community rallies against racism. So even despite all that power that he has and that the media amplifies uh, his negative message uh, on hateful and discriminatory topics can still be appropriately responded to and denounced. And has that message changed in your opinion? I, I think the message that I look at is from the American people and when I see uh, the enormous pushback uh, uh, against uh, deportation of immigrant children, um, against the Supreme Court's upholding of Trump's Muslim travel ban, I hear widespread bipartisan uh, uh, red and blue state and community denunciation of discrimination that we are all saying is inconsistent with American values. All right, and given that, given that statement, yet every poll that comes out shows that Trump, in terms of Trump's approval rating, uh, the support of his base, Mm. really hasn't changed significantly. I, and I think that's interesting because this is my view, that not everybody who supports Trump is a racist, right? They are supporting him for other reasons. And I do know, I do have Democratic liberal friends who will not even speak to somebody who voted for Trump. And dare I say, I know people who voted for Trump, and they are decent people. They are not racially discriminatory. They deplore those aspects of his record. They have some hope. I wish they were right that he's going to be good for the economy and good for the middle class and, and the people who are suffering from opioid abuse and tragedies of unemployment and underemployment. So I think it's important to, you know, there are so many issues that one takes into account in going to the polls. I choose to believe that very few of his supporters, I think there's, most of them are supporting him despite those despicable views rather than because of them. And what's your expectation? I know we only have a minute left in, in this program. What's your expectation for 2020? Will those Trump supporters continue to vote for him? I am not involved in partisan politics, but I will say this, no matter who is elected, there will continue to be challenges to and violations of civil liberties. So I'm very happy that the ACLU as a nonpartisan organization will continue to fight every violation of civil liberties by every president or official, Republican, Democrat, or other. All right, well, good way to dodge the question, <laughs> but I'll accept that. All right, that's all we have in this program. Make sure you watch part two. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching.
Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.